Hi, I'm Adam. This is Kevin. And we are Tech Guys Who Invest. This is the place for business people and investors to learn all about investing. We offer a fresh perspective on what it's like to have a day job while investing. And we share lessons learned on our investing journey. Our vision is to educate and entertain you while adding tons of value to your daily commute. Welcome to our show. We're back with another weekly episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where it's our job to teach you how to invest wisely and safely. As such, we're always looking to bring knowledge and awesome guests to you loyal listeners. What we've done is we've brought on David Stein, and David Stein is the host of the Money for the Rest of Us podcast, which is a weekly personal finance show on money, investing, and the economy. The show has over 250 episodes and more than 10 million downloads. Before being the host of the Money for the Rest of Us podcast, David was the chief investment strategist and chief portfolio strategist at Fund Evaluation Group, a $70 billion institutional investment advisor. Let me repeat that, a $70 billion institutional investment advisor. David is also the author of the book, Money for the Rest of Us, 10 Questions to Master Successful Investing. The book will be published by McGraw-Hill in October 2019. Now, we wanted to bring David onto the show so we can pick his brain about the strategies, the way he manages risk, and the, the, the way he looks at assets before he embarks on committing um, copious amounts of money to a particular investment. And what you'll hear on the show is there are things that you can apply, whether you're investing investing billions of dollars or managing your own portfolio that is going to help you become a safer and wiser investor. So without further ado, I want to bring the episode and interview with David Stein. But before we do that, actually, I lied, I'm sorry. We do have an offer from Adam's friend and real estate investor, Rod Cleave. So check out this offer. One of my friends in the real estate space, Rod Cleef, is hosting another one of his live events in Baltimore, September 27th through 29th, and it's all about multifamily investing. If you've never been, you've got to go. If you want to attend this event, and I highly recommend you do, I have a discount code for you to get $100 off your ticket price. Go to rodsbootcamp.com and enter the code TGWI, as in tech guys who invest. TGWI at checkout. So that's rodsbootcamp.com and enter the discount code TGWI and get tickets for $100 off this event. David, thank you so much for being a guest on the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. We're excited to pick your brain as a former financial advisor. So thank you for being on the show. Oh, it's, it's super to be here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. We're really glad to have you. So from a financial advising perspective, uh, do you help people, when you were a financial advisor, were you helping people plan for retirement or what did that look like? No, I was, I was primarily an institutional advisor. So I worked with uh, institutions, mostly endowments and foundations, not-for-profits. And we did manage assets for financial planners. So we put out models for them. But I, I didn't spend a lot of time working with individuals because it, it, it's much different. I, mean, I had a few like super wealthy family office types, but institutions are easier because you have boards and committees, but at the end of the day, it's not their money. So they're, they're, <laughs> they don't quite have quite as much emotion involved in it. So that, that makes it a little easier. Plus the sums are bigger, so you can, you can put together more sophisticated portfolios. Fantastic. So when you talk about emotion, um, I'd love to get your, your, your thoughts on that, because I think that's a big thing. Adam and I are from the school of thought where you do the math, the math tells you what to do. Don't, don't involve your emotion because when you do that, you may fall in love with something, even though the numbers don't make sense. So where do you stand with, uh, when you talk to people about uh, emotion and investing? Well, I think, I think you're correct. You need to control your emotions, but the markets are priced on emotions. So you, you have the math, you can do the math of a particular investment. And the math is a function of the cash flow. You know, what, if it's a real estate investment, it's a bond, it's stock, what's that cash flow? How is that cash flow growing? 
But the emotion is how are investors pricing that cash flow? And real estate's a great example. If you look at the capitalization rates on real estate, they're at all-time lows right now. So the, the market is exuberant about real estate. So there, you, have to, you have to take that emotion into account when you're pricing deals because you know, deals now have cap rates of less than 5%, where 10 years ago, it was double that. And so that's where they, you, you need to be aware of the emotion but control your own emotions so you're not, as you mentioned, making falling in love with properties, which I, you know, I've done my share of. And <laughs> because it, it's hard, especially with real estate, right? You, it, it's very easy to fall in love with a property. Yeah, it's, so it's, it really is. Do you, uh, do you focus on real estate a little bit as well? To, to some extent, I found, like I've done properties where we converted a single family home into a triplex. I, I'm involved in, in other sort of college rental. But I find when it comes back to emotion, I don't like the emotion, the taxing emotion of managing a property or finding somebody to manage it. So from that standpoint, all the equity real estate I own right now, it's either through an institutional fund or it's something that it's land, you know, agricultural land, something like that. The, you know, I do, I know one of your I think it was an episode in April on notes. So I have several notes that I hold on properties that, um, which I actually find kind of interesting. Maybe we'll get to that, that there's, there's an opportunity there, particularly because so many individuals want to buy, uh, do real estate through their individual retirement account. And there's not that many banks that will, will lend on that because they can't get a personal guarantee because it's the IRA that owns it. So I've done a 12 plex that I lent on that and, and the rate was six and a half percent. So higher than the gentleman that's higher than his cap rate, basically. So the debt was earning more than his equity investment. Interesting. Right. Wow. So, yeah. So how does institutional uh, fund investing work. I know you talked about that, and I, just for our listeners, they, I want to clarify what that is and how that that works. Well, there's similar. So most, like a college endowment, let's say a two hundred million dollar endowment, they'll hire a investment advisor. Sometimes they're called investment consultants that will work with the staff, they'll work with the board to set a, a target asset allocation. They'll help them select specific investments, be it exchange traded funds, index funds, or actively managed strategies. Most of the time, it involves a significant allocation to private capital, so venture capital, leverage buyout, real estate. You're, you're sort of kind of, you have outside managers, but you're sort of kind of the gatekeeper and, and the continuity, because the board might turn over, but the advisor will be there. And so that's, that's generally done on what's known as called a non-discretionary basis. But then there's something called outsourced CIO where the advisor, and we did this also, takes discretion, can actually make changes without getting the approval of the committee or the board, which you know makes it more fun, but it <laughs> makes it easier on the board, but so you get both of those sides. Okay. Uh, hey, sorry, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I was curious if because that seems like it just sounds like the sophisticated professional world of investing. I mean, to me, and I think a lot of people who might listen to this, uh, who may not, you know, a lot of them are not professional investors. that are people who work a day job and uh, they think about investing in terms of being able to have enough for retirement. And then, David, what you're talking about just sounds like this whole other level of sophistication and people who do this for a living. And, um, and that's really neat to me. So I was kind of wondering how you think about personal investing. And I'm sure you've taken a lot of the techniques and the, the knowledge you've gained from investing professionally and, and apply that in some ways. What are some ways you kind of see that mm -hmm. crossing over into personal investing? Well, I think the key thing is that we're all portfolio managers. And what portfolio managers do is they allocate their assets among different opportunities that have different return drivers. And, and that, to some extent, that's what institutional investing is. Even if it's a billion dollar portfolio, you have multi return drivers, multiple asset classes, 
maybe the actual vehicle you use to implement it might be different, but I, that's the way I look at it. So as an individual investor and in what I teach uh, on my website and in my book is we're portfolio managers. We don't have to be an expert. Most of the committee members on a not-for-profit, they're not necessarily investment experts. I mean, you need some baseline knowledge, but basically you're using rules of thumb to, to make the best decision given the market environment and, and making sure that we don't, you know, don't, I don't know, the cliche is don't put all your eggs in one basket, but that's true. <laughs> you really want a different assets. You want public assets that are tied to financial markets. You want some private assets that are away from the financial system. You want investments, which are things that have a positive expected return. And then perhaps you want maybe 10% in speculations. And that's would be something like gold or cryptocurrencies or something where there's some disagreement on whether the return will be positive or negative. You know, speculations typically don't have an income component. Investments typically have an income component, or at least an earnings component, where the cash flow is growing. Interesting. Uh, that is a definitely, it sheds a new light onto uh, that institutional and how you look at uh, individual portfolio management. So I think that's cool. So thank you for sharing that. In your experience, what have you seen has been the most successful investment asset classes? Well, it, it depends on it depends on the environment. I mean, clearly over the long term, stocks have been the, the highest performing asset class, generally speaking. I mean, you have some venture capital that have done better than that. But for, for most individuals, stocks is probably where they can get the most return. The downside is that they're subject to 60% withdrawals or drawdowns in terms of losses. And, and that's when, again, when the motion comes in, when we look at, you know, we, we're into 10 years into this bull market, that means there's a lot of investors that have never experienced a 50% drawdown on their stocks. And, and that it'll be interesting, particularly in the, in the fire community that, that the financial independence, retire early community that has really taken hold over the past decade. Most have never, they say they'll be fine suffering a 60% loss. We'll see how that turns out. Cause it, it when, when you're in the depths of a 2008, you, like you don't know when it's going to end and it can be very difficult to invest in that environment. Yeah. This is a topic that's pretty interesting to both Kevin and I, uh, you know, we've talked about it before and, uh, it's clear that we're at the top of some kind of a cycle and, and you know, nobody knows what, what's coming or, or when it's coming. But um, what, what types of things do you like to see people thinking about to prepare for it, especially just normal working people, you know, like white collar folks who um, aren't sure what they sh should do or could do to prepare for some type of a correction? Well, I, I think it's important to just to be aware, right? I mean, it's not that hard to, if you see people, for example, let's say 2017, when everyone's talking about cryptocurrencies, right? A lot of individuals just went out and, and, and bought them not knowing what they were. Now, if it was just a little bit of money, that's fine. But I, I think as investors or even individuals, we, we can be aware of what's going on if there's a lot of hype or there's a lot of fear and we can make allocation decisions based on that, right? Leading up to 2006, 2007, I mean, it was clear there was a housing bubble. I mean, I, I don't, it still dumbfounds me that, for example, I remember a guy, he moved to our town in Idaho. He went back to school. He had money to go back to school because he lived in Kentucky and he had gone down to Florida to buy some building lots unseen, didn't even look at the lots. <laughs> no, and they doubled in price. And, and then he sold them. But like in that type of environment, when you have that type of horrendous exuberance, that's a time to be cautious. When you have a, a huge amount of fear, like 2009, and once it became clear that things were actually starting to get better, it's, I mean, that was the time to invest because you had very, very inexpensive valuations across asset classes. And so it's not, you're never, you're not trying to time the week or the month, it's just being aware of really what drives investment returns and, and how that works. I mean, if you invest in real estate, you know it's driven by rents. Well, if you know that you're getting less, you're 
earning less in terms of your yield or your cap rate, well, something's not necessarily, it's not just not a good environment. You're not going to earn as much. Right. And so when things are more expensive, you, and so you have to adjust your expectations also. So it's not, I mean, it takes some time, but it, it's, you just can't stick your head in the sand. Okay. So you're saying that pay attention to what's around you. You should still invest, but be cautious when the time, when the clues in the news, if you will, are telling you that something is going on. Or you could use those clues in the news as a, as a marker when to be aggressive as well. No, oh, exactly. I mean, when you hear people say, I'll never invest in stocks again, or like, I'm going to buy my third home and flip it, right? I mean, when everybody suddenly is an expert in real estate, then that's, that's we should be cautious in that environment. And, you know, but, you know, often environments, it's neither, right? People aren't overly, right, the current environment. The you know, people are not overly excited about the stock market. I mean, we've had 10 years of recovery, but there's still a healthy skepticism. They, you know, there's the economy is slowing, but it's not falling off a cliff. So it's not a time to be panicking by any means. You know, this is July 2019, but it's just being at least on a surface basis aware of what's going on. Absolutely. Sorry about that weird noise there. I apologize. That was, I think it might've been on my end. Um, I wanted to ask you about different strategies in investing in stocks. For example, my extent of the knowledge is you kind of, um, I've heard buy low, sell high, but that's definitely not the approach I would recommend. I think more of like an index fund investing, but I know that there are things like shorting and, and things of that nature. Is that something you experience as an in- institutional investor or you have in, as an individual? And if so, could you talk about that? Well, yeah, well, sh- shorting is when you expect the stocks to go down and you, you borrow the shares and, and sell them. And then when it's gone down, hopefully, then you buy the shares back and return them to whoever you, you borrowed them from. Hedge funds do it. Individuals probably shouldn't. When, when you're shorting stocks, I mean, stocks is an asset class with a positive expected return. It has positive yield, it has positive earnings growth. And so basically you're betting against the ingenuity of a capitalist system when you're short. And so, and you can lose unlimited amounts of money when you're short. And so it's not something most individuals should do. They, they really should be focused on index funds or exchange traded funds because there, and that's how I invested it institutionally. I mean, I. I have always focused on asset classes. So I'd rather be diversified by asset classes. I don't, I mean, I used to buy individual stocks, but I spent so many years researching professional money managers who were stock pickers and being disappointed how frequently they underperformed or were wrong. Because when it comes to stock investing, it, it's, a, it's a meeting of the mind. So you have buyers and sellers and they collectively transact at a certain price based on their collective view. And that collective view typically has been correct. I mean, has been correct. And so when we're buying an individual stock, our position is the market's wrong. Your belief is that this stock is mispriced, that it is selling below its intrinsic value. And that's hard to do because what one of the things you have to consider is like who's selling that stock to you? One of the questions I always ask is, you know, who's on the other side of the trade? So if I'm, it's because it's an auction market. Maybe it's the same in real estate, right? Who's selling you that real estate property? Why are they selling that? Are they highly motivated seller because they're overly leveraged, so they're they're willing to take any price, or is it? It's the same with the stock market. Who is selling that stock? And and in the stock market today, it's driven by institutions and quantitative investors that and a professional investment class. And so the idea that as individuals, we know more than the collective market, most of the time the market's wrong and or the individual, you're not gonna be right. Now you can get overall asset classes that can get mispriced in terms of over exuberance, but figuring out which particular stock is mispriced, it's very difficult to do. Benjamin Graham could do it, because and Warren Buffett could do it in the early days because who was on the other side of the trade typically? It was individual investors. Now it's mostly professional institutional investors 
a lot of bots, a lot of quantitative algorithms, it's hard to get some type of informational edge in that environment. So for that reason, I invest in index funds typically or ETFs. Now, David, you mentioned the word speculation earlier. Um, what do you what do you consider uh, good investments to consider for speculation? And, and could you unpack that a little bit for people who may not be familiar about how uh, someone like yourself thinks about speculation? Right. Well, speculation is where nobody knows what the right price is. It, gold, for example, there, there is no income to gold. If you make money owning gold coins, and I do the, own, the only way to make money is somebody buys it at a higher price at a later date. But there's no rhyme or reason what the right price should be. The same with, with Bitcoin. There is no P-E ratio for Bitcoin that you can, an objective measure. There's no cap rate for Bitcoin or dividend yield. So it, it's, it's purely speculation because no, there's a disagreement on what the right price could be. And an investment, there's some objective criteria. We can look at the income and say, what am I paying for this income stream? Or what's that income stream discounted in today's dollars? Or what's the earnings and how fast are the earnings growth? So that, in my mind, that's what investing is. That's where most of our time should be spent. It's fine spending some time with, with speculation, but it should be because you never know if you're going to be the right price and you don't have kind of that income. I mean, you can be wrong, for example, in your real estate price, but because you're getting the rent over time, right, you're not going to lose your shirt. If you're wrong in speculation, it, it can be very painful and you don't have any income to sort of mitigate those losses. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then what, how, do, how do you use that in your overall strategy? Do you kind of use it as a hedge or do you use it as a, you know, just a, a diversification of some sort? In terms of the speculations that I use? Right. Yeah. I mean, they're hedges. I mean, I, if I look at my portfolio, less than 10% speculation. So I, I have gold. Uh, James Grant of Grant Interest Rate Observer says gold is an option on basically uncertainty. I mean, if, yeah. We don't know if there's going to be a monetary collapse. I, I don't think so. But gold is an asset class. It's been around for millennia. It makes a nice hedge. You know, cryptocurrencies are an interesting hedge also. And I own some antiques. Antiques, it's not so much a hedge, but it's something apart from the financial system that it's not tied to that. But generally, the workhorse of most people's portfolio should be investments, things that generate income, which can include real estate, include stock, it can include bonds. And in multiple different types, but the key is, okay, what's the cash flow being generated? And is that cash flow growing over time? And if so, at what rate? And how is that cash flow being valued? Are people paying a premium for that cash flow? Or they're fearful and don't want to own that cash flow stream, and so valuations are cheap. Interesting. That is a very interesting way of, of putting it. And I like that you were talking about hedging your bet. Uh, you also, when we were talking about shorting, you talked about borrowing stocks. And I was curious, is there any way that you could finance the purchase of stocks or investments in that nature? Well, like yeah, you I mean, you, yeah, I mean, you, that's what margin is, right? You can take out a margin loan and leverage up and buy stocks. The, the problem for individuals is the margin rates, the interest rate you're paying is five, six, 7%. A hedge fund can do it at, basically whatever 30 day treasury yields are. So, I mean, that, that's why hedge funds exist because they can <laughs> borrow very cheaply and leverage up the asset class. Now, you know, as investors, we, I don't know if you've talked about mortgage REITs on your, on your show, mortgage real estate investment trust. I mean, that, that is a leverage, that's a pure leverage play. So you have an institution that is able to borrow short, typically in the repurchase repo market. So it's basically overnight interest. And then they buy mortgage backed securities. So bonds, but they lever up three to four times and then they have a yield of 8%. So that that's a way to, to be levered or play leverage as an individual. But generally speaking, we shouldn't be borrow, borrowing on our brokerage account to, to buy stocks or other asset classes, real estate, 
I mean, it depends. I mean, most people use leverage for real estate, but the deal has to stand on its own. Right. And, and make sure that you know, on an unlevered basis, it, it has a decent return. And I think, you know, one of the things you're seeing in the real estate market now is that it often doesn't have a decent return on an unlevered basis. It's, it's the leverage that's leading to the, the, the higher return and talk, people talk themselves in, into buying it just because it, it looks better with leverage. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I, um, I heard someone talk once about the concept of insuring stock uh, in some way, like do, making, a, making a play that would allow them to essentially insure their, their stock purchases in some way. Have you heard of anything like that? Yeah, I mean, they, there's, there's option strategies where you're, you're basically – buying some type of portfolio insurance. The, the problem with the stock market is the stock market is way more volatile and has way more extreme events than what most people anticipate. So, I mean, and I've priced this out in my membership community. People have asked this question, like, what if I want to hedge my portfolio against a, a greater than, let's say, 5% loss? Well, and then you can go buy put options and make sure you have enough to cover the size of your portfolio. Well, the cost of that ends up being two to three percent per year. So, and that's where you, you realize, okay, the market knows that or options are priced, recognizing the market is way more volatile than your typical financial advisor assumes. And you know that because it costs two to three percent to hedge your portfolio against a five to eight percent loss. And, and that really lowers your overall return. So for most investors, it doesn't make sense to hedge. It's better. It's better to make sure you scale your stock exposure to where if there's a 50 to 60% loss, you're not decimated, that it doesn't, you're, the personal harm, because there's two types of risk. The risk is, you know, what happens in terms of the overall market, but there's the impact of what it is on, on your portfolio. Now, somebody's young and, and many decades from retirement, well, they can withstand those 50 to 60% losses. So what, maybe they have 70 to 80% in stocks. But if you're, you're 60, you can't be 80% in stocks because in that case, a 60% loss drawdown would, you'd have to push back your retirement for four or five years. And so that, that's where it's, it's important. But generally, the best way to hedge is through your asset allocation, having different return drivers and don't do it by buying put options or other type of portfolio insurance. So from an allocation perspective, could you talk about uh, percentage, what you've seen is the most successful in your experience? Well, I mean, it, it, it depends in terms of the, you know, I think, you know, phrasing it the most successful, there is no, there is not a most successful strategy other than have multiple return drivers. I mean, you can be a minimalist investor and have two holdings. You can own VT, you can own the Vanguard Total World Stock Market ETF, and you can own the equivalent, you know, U.S. bond ETF. And, and, and that'd be it. And, you know, maybe you're 80% stocks and 20% bonds. And, and so in this environment, you know, the, my expected return for stocks over the next decade is about 6.5%. The bonds right now, it's going to be closer to 2.5%. And you can do the math. I can't do that in my head. But, you know, collective, you know, at 80, 80, 20 portfolio, right, it's going to be about a 5% expected return portfolio, which is low. I mean, that's where, you know, as individuals, we need to recognize that we're, we're not in an environment where stocks are going to return 10% and anymore because the dividend yields are too low and the value that investors are placing on their cash flow, right, the price to earnings ratio, which is, is effectively what price is the market paying, paying for $1 worth of earnings? Well, it's over 20. It's in, on a looking at what's known as the, the Schiller PE or cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, where you have the price of the market. This is the US stock market divided by the earnings. That PE is 28. The average going back to 1969 is about 19. And so we're much higher than that. So in that environment, as the expected return for stocks or, you know, for the U.S. stock market is, is about 5 to 6%. The non-U.S. market's a little higher, 
you know, six to eight, but collectively it's about a six and a half percent return. And so, and that's what it is. I mean, that's where we have to recognize, all right, if we put it in a retirement calculator, this is what we're going to earn on a re and that's the reasonable expectation. And then, so then when you're looking at alternative asset classes, such as real estate, so that, I mean, that's kind of what you're comparing. All right, well, I can earn two and a half percent on bonds. I potentially could earn 6% on stocks over the long term. What is this deal going to get me? And does it make sense? I like that. I was, I was going to ask if you had, uh, had seen people try out things like, um, I think it, I think it was Ray Dalio who had a kind of like a formula that people could use. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the all weather portfolio, which it. is, it's, a and the approach there, and it's an, it's an intriguing approach because the idea is for most individuals, the stock market is the most volatile of asset classes. So even at, let's say they're 50, 50, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, most of the volatility and the returns are driven by what's going on in the stock market because the range of potential return for bonds is going to be very narrow. And so the idea that all weather portfolio is instead of having so much of your volatility dependent on stocks that you own long-term bonds. If you own very long-term bonds, they're going to be as volatile as the stock market. And if you own gold, it's going to be as volatile as the stock market. And the idea is during different economic regimes, the, these different asset types will offset each other. It works. I mean, Ray Dalio has run hedge funds for years doing that. Now, in their case, they, they lever up their bonds and, and use leverage. Where most people have trouble implementing it is they're not comfortable having, they're comfortable that stocks are volatile. It freaks them out that their bonds are volatile. So they have, if interest rates, you know, this year is great, right? If you own long-term bonds. But if interest rates went up 2%, that long-term bonds would, would fall 30, 40%, right? So, so, I mean, that's the idea. You want everything to be volatile and hopefully it offsets each other. But psychologically, we talk about emotion again, that can be difficult for individuals. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. And, and it's difficult for institutions. I mean, I, I had a pension fund client once that they owned because, you know, a pension, basically, they have all these liabilities, these retirees that are going to retire. They wanted to, they had a long duration bond manager. They own very long term bonds, 30 year bonds. And, you know, it made sense. It's called asset liability matching. So they had their assets. And the idea was, OK, if interest rates fall, our liabilities in terms of what we're going to owe to retirees is going to be higher. And so we're going to own these long term bonds so that they'll go up at the same time. Well, that worked great when investment yields were falling, but the one year when interest rates went up, I, I remember the investment committee saying, you know, why do we own these things? Like, and this wasn't a strategy. I recommended it. I sort of inherited it. But, you know, here's a sophisticated pension committee that adopted, it, adopted a very sophisticated asset liability strategy. The minute interest rates started going up, they started questioning it. And they couldn't stomach the volatility. And I think oftentimes individuals like this whole this whole all weather portfolio has gotten a lot of press but most individuals have not experienced the downside that can come from that strategy particularly over the past decade yeah that, i imagine if they bail at, at the wrong time that's exactly the wrong thing to do and then it ends up oh, hurting them exactly yeah yeah it's got to be a very long term strategy and you have just to learn to ignore it and and i you know i don't invest that way i'm cuz i I'm not comfortable owning long duration bonds because, you know, I did a podcast episode on this recently because you need, whenever you own any asset class, you have to say, ask, well, what role does this play in my portfolio? Is if you're doing this all weather portfolio, the role of bonds is to be volatile and to offset the volatility of stocks. In my portfolio, the role of bonds is income. It's strictly income. And so I'm, I, in this environment, I'll own short-term bonds because I can get two and a half percent. The same as a 10-year treasury bond. Why would you own 10-year treasury if you can get the same yield? Well, the only reason is, is because you believe interest rates are going to fall. So that, that's a different role. So then you're speculating in interest rates. We're talking about speculation. You're making a binary bet that interest rates are going to go up and down. 
And that's what speculation is. It's, it's a binary choice. It's either you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong. You have to be precisely right or, pre- or you're going to be precisely wrong. I prefer investing where there's some income. So I don't have to be precisely right. I just have to be vaguely right and collect <laughs> that income. Now, uh, speaking of income, and uh, you talked about intrinsic value earlier, Adam and I, when we invest in real estate, we look for problems to solve. And it's easier for us on the real estate side because we can talk to the seller, get their motivation. I imagine when you're looking at a company, it might be a bit harder And as an individual investor. Uh, how would you go about finding intrinsic value then in a, in a company? I don't. But as an investor, I mean, the best institutional managers I know on the stock side do exactly what you described. They want problem stocks. They want stocks that are complex, that nobody's willing to do the work to understand, to figure out, you know, what's going on. And, you know, they don't want story stocks like Amazon. Amazon's a story stock. You buy that stock because you believe that for whatever reason, the stock market has underestimated the growth aspects of of Amazon. You don't buy Amazon because it's a good company or because, you know, they make a lot of money. It's because the market's wrong. And so when you're buying a stock and doing the research, again, you're assuming the market's wrong. So you have to figure out, okay, why is the market wrong? And that takes time. And you're competing as professionals. I don't want to spend time doing that. Mm-hmm. I'd rather invest, you know, one of my favorite areas to invest is what's known as closed end funds. You know, closed end funds or closed end mutual funds. You know, the, an open end mutual fund, there's unlimited amounts of shares. So every day, the, the investment manager says, okay, here's what we own. Here's what it's worth. Here's the net asset value uh, per share. And so everybody that does the buy sell orders and everybody gets priced at the net asset value. A closed end fund is there's a limit. There's a, a limited amount of shares. So it trades on an exchange, just like a stock, but it, there's still a manager there investing. And so you can go in every day and say, okay, here's the value of the assets. Here's the net asset value, but here's how the market's priced it. And there's times when they're selling at a 15 to 20% discount relative. And this isn't, I mean, this is an extremely inefficient market from that standpoint. And you step back, well, why? Why isn't this, this discount, doesn't it narrow? And it's because it's a small market. It's mostly retail investors that panic. And, and so... And it's, it's a market that shouldn't exist, but if I mean, the closed end funds have been around longer than regular mutual funds, but there's, I mean, if somebody wants to be a trader, why not do closed end funds where you can see where there's a discount and collect the income and realize this is what you're going to make money at. You can make money at it. But most individuals, when they decide they want to trade, suddenly they're out buying commodity futures and foreign exchange. You know, things that they have to be precisely right in order to make money. They're usually precisely wrong because they're taken advantage by institutional traders and bots. And that's a terrible place to start investing. I mean, if you, real estate's a much better place to start investing <laughs> because you can actually look at it and get some income yield and, and do it right. But most, for, I, I know it dumbfounds me. Where, what other category do you pick up the tools and start competing with professionals. No tennis, you don't do that. You, you don't pick up a tennis racket and suddenly you're, you're in the ATP tournament. Right. But people do that all the day with foreign exchange. Well, yeah, I'm going to be an investor. I'll, I'll start doing my Forex account. And well, you're competing against professionals. <laughs> and the, the phrase in the hedge fund space is you're going to get your face ripped off. And they do. That um, I talked to I was I was shopping for furniture a while ago and a bed actually because they the the, the spot the bed, the bed they were sponsoring my podcast so we had to go look for a bed because <laughs> I got tired of talking about the bed without owning it well the salesman <laughs> was way more excited about trading and he had spent twenty five thousand dollars to learn how to trade he was oh 65 wow and he says yeah my goal is to retire in five years trading. And I said, do you, does your company have a 401k? He'd worked for him for 15 years. Yeah, we, we have a 401k, but I, I haven't participated because stocks are risky. And yet now he's trying foreign exchange and options. And so I, 
I actually went, this was down in Phoenix. I said, tell me where you went. And so I went to the trading academy and I sat through four hours because I wanted to figure out how they're convincing a 65 year old man to pony up $25,000. And he says, well, you got to invest in yourself. And I sat through it and they're very upfront, this trading academy, unlike many of them, they, they have a patent. They said, we have a patent. And they did. I read their patent. The patent is most investors are unsophisticated. And if you're going to be a successful trader, you have to take advantage of unsophisticated investors. And they were teaching people how to do that. Wow. Which is, Whoa. which it's true, because, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of sad too. I don't want to make money taking advantage of, of unsophisticated investors. And I yeah. probably wouldn't still, even I tried, I wouldn't be very good at it. And that, that's uh, interesting that it's it's just out there and that I'm glad we're talking about this because a lot of people don't know that or haven't heard it explicitly and may have suspected it, but didn't know for sure. Oh, so it's it really was, interesting. It was crazy. I mean, I, there was probably 20 people in the room. Nobody should have been there. But the pitch was, okay, we recognize you're behind in saving for retirement and the only way you're going to get ahead is you have to use leveraged asset classes. Wow. You're going to have to, so, and Forex works because it's highly levered. And the way you make money is you have to lose, don't lose as much as you gain. So you get out in time and we'll teach you how to do that. But nobody, nobody stays around long enough. Very few will actually do it. And the other thing that frustrates me about it is they all say, if you even go through the school, I won't even give the name of the school, but you can see who, who their instructors are and they have certain criteria. But nobody says how much money they actually have at stake, how much skin in, in the game. Yeah, I might be a successful trader, but my trading account might be $10,000. Okay, that's very different if you're managing a million or more, right? I mean, I, as an institutional investor, we manage $2 billion. When you're making trades with $2 billion, it's way scarier and it plays with your emotions again versus if you're five to ten thousand i can imagine so david if if you were uh to give someone who wanted to begin their education their investing education uh what resources might you point them to to begin learning about uh some helpful tools, some things that would be good for someone who's starting from scratch to learn about? Well, if they're, if they're starting from scratch, uh, you know, a, a good book that just came out recently is Aaron Lowry's book. It's the Broke Millennial's Guide to Investing. And it, it's very basic. It like how to open a broker, bro, brokerage account and things like that. Yeah. The, um, I get asked that question a lot. And, and what I found, you know, as I studied the the investing book market, the, there's a gap there, right? You have very basic investment books. You know, here's how index funds works, et cetera. And then suddenly you're looking at real estate value strategies, Forex. There was nothing out there that says, okay, how do I decide which asset class to look at? And so actually I have a book coming out published in October, this October by McGraw Hill. And it's, it's money for the rest of us, 10 questions to master successful investing. And it's, it's, the 10 questions you should ask before you invest in anything. And, and this is things we talked about. Now, first off, what is it to be able to just explain an investment in your own words to somebody. And if you can't do it, then you shouldn't invest. And most people, people, if you ask, well, please explain if I, this guy, can you explain foreign exchange to me? How exactly what's going on here? What, what you couldn't do it. And you know, with real estate, you should be able to explain it. Know what your know if it's investing, speculating, gambling like that we talked about. Does it have? Is there disagreement on the price or is there income? And what's the upside? What's the downside in terms of the maximum potential loss? Who's on the other side of the trade? We've talked about that here. Like who are you trading with when you're doing it? And then you know other questions such as you know, what's the investment vehicle? And another important question is just you know what does it take to be successful? For this real estate transaction to work out, what has to happen and, and what could go wrong? And, and we often don't just do that to understand. We just sort of hope it for the best. And so, you know, that would that'd be one resource. Another one, I mean, a podcast, listen to podcasts like yours and others is a great way. It depends on what kind of learner you are. If you're a, an audio 
it's not the word, but you know, you, you learn basically through listening and you know, podcasts are great for that. Right. And speaking of resources, and I know you mentioned you have a podcast, where can our listeners find you if they want to learn more about uh, your book, if they want to learn more about how you invest and things of that nature? Sure. Well, my website's moneyfortherestofus.com. It's also the name of the podcast. The, the book's at moneyfortherestofusbook.com. And you, people can look at that there. Yeah, that, that's sort of where you can find me. Excellent. So, yeah, we, we really enjoyed having you on, David. I think you've added tremendous value to our listeners and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and educate us. Before we let you go, uh, we, as the tech guys who invest, like to have a little fun and sometimes ask our, uh, our guests a tech question, uh, mm-hmm. usually a fun one, kind of like what's a what's a piece of tech that you've really enjoyed recently or what's your favorite piece of tech? Or, uh, so yeah, we'd like to ask you that. What's, uh, what's your favorite piece of technology right now? My favorite piece of technology. <laughs> or uh, least there's favorite. Lot, there's a lot of, uh, oh gosh, that's a good question. I mean, the, the one sort of investment related, which is technology focused. I just, I just did an episode on the Facebook's Libra their new cr- cryptocurrency. And then oh. that has a lot of uh, tech uh, behind it. Yeah, it, um, it does. You know, my recent tech purchases, The uh, I just bought a, a mirrorless camera for, I do YouTube. So, you know, that, um, you know, full frame mirrorless cameras, those, those are pretty cool. Nice. But, you know, the other, the other tech that I, I was, I've been involved with Amazon Web Services for, since 2012, I went to their first, invent conference, I guess. And so that, that whole idea of outsourcing and in the cloud computing and the fact, I mean, I even, I, I have an app for my membership site that I run on DynamoDB. So that, that whole idea that as individuals, we can run basically enterprise scale servers. Like, I don't know anything about tech, right? But I, you know, here I am, like I can, my storage is so cheap because it's an S3 bucket. And, you know, I can, it's, it's, it's a fascinating world from that aspect. So that whole aspect of, of cloud and, and all the tools available through Amazon, you know, to extent Microsoft also in the cloud is, is fascinates me. Nice. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you so much again for being a guest on the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. We learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners learned a lot as well. Great. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Tech Guys Who Invest. This is Adam. And this is Kevin. Thank you so much for listening to us. Don't forget to join our Facebook page where we're building a community of investors so that we can share ideas, tips, and other ways to help us get out of the rat race. If you found value in this podcast, it would mean the world to us if you could share it with your network. Lastly, we love feedback. It's how we get better. So if you wouldn't mind spending 30 seconds and leaving us an honest review on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're using, that would be super sweet. If you want to get on Adam or Kevin's calendar, go to tgwipodcast.com slash contact. We want to help you invest safely, wisely, and ultimately get you out of the rat race. Thanks again.